Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now, subhanAllah, it's very important for us as Muslims to study history. I know sometimes people are like, you know, it's boring, it can be frustrating. Why do we study it? But it's important because scholars have said that those that don't know the past are doomed to repeat the same mistakes and make the same failures. You know, when we study what's going on in India, for example, right now, or we study what's going on in China, there can be a lot of parallels that are drawn from what happened to Muslims in Spain. So I think there was a little bit of miscommunication, but inshallah, we'll try to do the best that we can. So I'm gonna be talking about some of the achievements and some of the decline up until 1492. And then inshallah, the sister's going to continue, Dr. Maryam is going to continue after that inshallah. So Alhamdulillah, when Islam came into Spain, there are many phases. And one of the things that I want you to know that initially when Islam came in, there was order, there was stability, there was a process that used to take place. There was a chain of command. The leadership, the scholars, the generals, they were all on the same page. I'll give you one example. So many of you know Tariq Niziyad. Tariq Niziyad was a general and a commander who ended up bringing the Muslims into Spain. And there are many battles that happened, alhamdulillah, it's very successful. So, but he was a commander. Above him was Musa ibn Nusayr. And Musa was the governor, right? And above him, there was a Khalifa, Walid ibn Abd al-Malik. And they all worked together on the same page. So one of the things that happened, alhamdulillah, after the Muslims came into Spain, is that Tariq Niziyad, who was very young at the time when he led the Muslims into Spain, about some say 17, some say 21, he wanted to expand and he wanted to go further and further into Spain. And so did the governor, Musa ibn Nusayr. Musa ibn Nusayr would say that he was in his 70s, but he was the one that would lead the charges and he would be on the horse. But the Khalifa sent him a message. And the Khalifa is in Damascus at this time. And Walid ibn Abdul Malik, who was a Khalifa, after they got into Spain and they wanted to keep expanding, going store more west into um, France and other places, into Europe, the Khalifa had said no. And he told Tariq and Musa to come back to Damascus. How do you think they responded? If it was about them and their goals and their objectives, they're on the ground, they would have said, no, we're going to go forward. But what they did was, look, we have to have order. We have to have a process. So Tariq and Musa, they ended up going back to Damascus. And Walid Abdul, Abdul, Abdul Malik, Walid ibn Abdul Malik, who was a Khalifa at the time, he passed away three days after they got back to Damascus. And it wasn't that Walid didn't want the Islamic world to expand and the Muslims to go into France and other places. No, Walid's justification was that it's too much too fast and the soldiers aren't going to be able to bear it. So what ended up happening is that his brother, Suleiman became the Khalifa. And usually, if you learn about the history, brothers don't always agree on everything, right? We all know that. But Suleiman told Tariq and Musa, that I agree with my brother on this, it's too much too fast. So what ends up happening? It's very odd, historically, right? We try to have facts and we try to cover everything, but there's not a lot of information of what happened to Tariq Niziyad after that. Some people say he died in Spain, so sorry, in Damascus. Other people say he died other places. So there's not a lot of information about that. But we also see Musa ibn Nusayr, who was a governor, he wanted to go back to Spain. But he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, that if it's good for me to go back to Spain and be an asset, let me be an asset. Or, let me die in the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what ended up happening is Musa, he ended up performing hajj and dying in the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is how, these were the leaders that made Islam enter into Spain. When we talk about Islam, it's very important for us to understand Islam at a, in a collective, holistic manner. Yes, religion and the ibadat are very important and critical. But if you look at whether it's in Andalus, 
whether it's in Baghdad, in order for any society to function and flourish, in addition to the religion aspect, religious aspect, there's other things that need to take place for the community to feel safe and the community to flourish. And two things that they tried to do in Spain, which Alhamdulillah, they were successful for many, many years in doing, was the economy. If you look at the Muslim world today, what are our major import, uh, major exports, sorry, what are our major exports? Oil, besides oil. She said people, okay. What else? All right, da'wah, okay, mashallah. But if you look at it, think about this. I want you to expand your minds, inshallah. Are there people in the world today that are committing atrocities and doing things which are very bad, but no one says anything because they're economically strong? We all know it. Are there people that are doing things and economics, all of these things play an impact and a role, and they did at that time as well. So if you look at that period of history, when Muslims were in Spain, the Muslims were the ones that were exporting things to the rest of Europe. And I'm just gonna go through some of these lists, right? Because I want you to know, Alhamdulillah, that we do have the ability, the responsibility, and the capacity to be assets and not burdens, as some people portray us as. So we know that the people who came in Damascus, in the people from the Arabian Peninsula, who went into Spain, did they have a lot of water in the Arabian Peninsula? No, but Muslims were the ones in Spain that led to people developing the water wheel. The irrigation system set up by the Romans, right? And they nurtured that, they took care of it. Those that were falling apart, they enhanced it. They pumped water from rivers into fields that had fallen into disuse. Agriculture, arrows brought in plants from Syria. The Berbers introduced crops from North Africa. And I, I joke, you know, sometimes in our cultures, um, my in-law, my mother-in-law is there, but I was joking that, you know, I went to visit her sister in Baltimore and they gave us a plant to bring back to Chicago and say that grow this in your house. I don't know if that happens in a lot of cultures, but this is what happened in Spain. People from Syria, from Damascus, from the Arabian Peninsula, from the Berbers, from North Africa, everyone was coming into Spain to try to grow crops. And that's the basis of their economy. So the Muslims were the ones that introduced a lot of these crops into Europe, Western Europe as we know it. So the date palm, sugarcane, oranges, tangerines, lemons, grapefruits, apricots, almonds, artichokes, rice, saffron, eggplants, parsnips, cotton, mulberry tree, silkworm. They made their first appearance in Iberia, the Iberian Peninsula, during this time. So the Muslims were the ones who were exporting all of these things. Also, Muslims is very important, and it plays a role in the downfall as well. If you look at Baghdad, the golden age of Baghdad, if you look at the golden age in Spain, in any society, we talked about the economics, very important. Also the literature and the arts. Muslims have to produce things, right? So in Spain, they talk about Valencia, became a model for paradise. There's literature going on. Many of the texts or the tafasir that we read that are extremely beneficial to us in the West were written in Muslim Spain. Tafsir al-Qurtubi, Imam al-Shatubi's muwafiqat, and a lot of texts were written to have people understand that Islam is not based just in the Arabian Peninsula or in Asia, but Islam is dynamic enough to just excel in every society. Some other imported go exported, sorry, exported goods were silk, timber, agricultural products, gold from West Africa, Toledan steel had been famous since Roman times, Spanish horses, so these are all things that the Muslims contributed to the world. And there's also a lot of integration and collaboration of people from different faiths. There's one story I wanna share, and uh, I've read it in different texts, and inshallah she can tell us if it's authentic or not, but there's a story of Sancho the Fat, okay? Sancho the Fat, he was a Christian ruler, and his people, they overthrew him, saying that the reason he's fat and obese is because he's eating too much and he's taking advantage of the rights of the people. So what did Sancho do? He went to Abdurrahman III, who was a Khalifa in Qurtuba, 
and sought refuge with him. Abdurrahman III had a Jewish doctor. And the Jewish doctor put Sancho the Fat on a diet and helped him lose weight. And then Sancho went back and took over his people. So you see, a Christian king, a Muslim Khalifa, and a Jewish doctor working together for the betterment of the society. That's how things started off. And that's how things were for a number of years. And that's when we talk about this golden age. Understand, in addition to the religious aspect, the economy flourished. And the arts flourished. And alhamdulillah, people were able and willing to coexist. But there, was, there were some challenges. And those challenges did come back and harm the Muslims as well. And inshallah, we'll talk about that until what happened until 1492. So what ended up happening is, and, and I want to emphasize this point specifically because this problem exists within our communities of the United States, Muslims living in the United States. And it exists in India and other places as well. So when the Muslims came into Spain, there were three main categories of Muslims. There were the people that came from Syria, Damascus, uh, people who were from the Arabian Peninsula, they came into Spain, okay? That's one group of people. Then you had the Berbers who came from North Africa. They came into Spain as well. Then you had the people who were natives of Spain that had accepted Islam. So you have three distinct categories of people. The problem that existed since the beginning and it was never rectified, and it played a big role in the downfall, is that they never came together. The Arabs lived in their pockets, the Berbers lived in their pockets, and the Hispaniola are the ones who were native Spaniards, they lived in their pockets. So what happened is that the people who didn't want Muslims and Islam to be united, they preyed on these differences and ended up causing conflict within the Muslim community. And if you see what's happening in India right now, a lot of the same things are happening. Muslims have been there for many years. But even if you just take within the Sunnis over there, you have many different groups that never work together. And what's happening? They dividing and conquering Muslims, and we're all suffering from that as well. And if you look at what's happening in India, What's happening, and this is something that most Indians don't know about, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the strategies that they're using because they've used them elsewhere. And we're not aware of that, so we didn't know, okay, what's going on. So if people protest against the policies of the Hindu government, what ends up happening, if you got caught protesting, you get arrested and they take away your land and your property. Where do they do this? This also happens where else? In Palestine. So these are things that we as a Muslim Ummah need to understand and work together and understand that the, whatever happens in one Muslim community anywhere in the world, it will affect all of us. So let's bring it back. Don't we have the same issue in the United States? Just say the Chicagoland area. Those of you that are from here, I'm, I'm sure that many of you who are not from here, you have the same issues. Do we have segments and pockets of the Muslim community? The Arabs live here. African Americans live here, the Desis live here, and everyone's doing their own thing. But think about how messed up it is. If, let's say, a, prime, a, a dominant Desi community is having Salat al Maghrib, and there's a large contingent of Arab or African American Muslims or Uzbek Muslims that comes to Salah at that time, what would the majority of the people say? Why are they here? What's going on? Right? Like something's wrong. And this is a problem that we need to address. Okay, so that's one of the things that led to their downfall. Another thing is that they became delusional. They started attributing success to themselves rather than to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this led them to think that they're indestructible. All of our success, no matter if we're economically strong, no matter if we're physically strong, we have a big military, all of our success comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's something we need to remind ourselves time and time again. Another very important point that we need to emphasize 
is that the importance of balance. And I just gave a talk about the importance of balance. So we talked about Islam flourishing when arts flourish, when the economy flourishes, when the Muslim community is well-rounded and they're providing assets for those that are around them. But what ended up happening towards the end and towards the downfall is that became the people's primary objective. If you look at some of the stories that are mentioned in the late uh, 13th century and 14th century, and even the 15th century, it talks about how alcohol became widespread, how some of the things that are un-Islamic started to take root and people started to prefer these as forms of entertainment, which conflicted with their Islamic values. And that is something that people's hearts became attached to those more than to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as I mentioned, our success is in our religion and our commitment and our dedication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in us being economically strong and being an asset to those that are around us and also having a healthy dose of entertainment, culture, relaxation, but not going to extremes. So these are some of the things that led to our success. And inshallah, we can and will be successful in these things in the future. But also, if they're not maintained and balanced properly, they can also lead to our downfall. If we're not united as a community, then this is something that people will abuse. And they'll take us, the, like, if you think about it historically, right? And I want to just make this last point. Historically, Muslims have never lost or been defeated by people from outside of our community, non-Muslims, unless there are Muslims helping them. And this is something that's throughout history. So we need to be strong. And we need to stay together. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakum Allah khayna, subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah. Ashadu ala ilaha illa, nasafiru kanatu.